Dr. Miles Monroe is full of wisdom, and I'm glad he is with me on the program again today. I have been so blessed listening to him, and I know you have too, on overcoming crisis, how to manage crisis. I'm telling you, you really are a blessing to all of us. Thank you. You and I have been friends a long time. Yes. Precious. Yeah. We talked about overcoming crisis, and, and I, you, 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 you said some powerful things. Yes. But I want to talk about something else today, but let me just, one more time, real quick. Tell, what, uh, tell the precious people watching what you said about crisis, that God sends them, yes. that they are not forever, they are right. seasonal. And mm -hmm. there's probably somebody right now going through some painful experience. Yes. Would you look at the camera there, Dr. Monroe? A crisis is an experience, an event, a circumstance that affects you or your environment over which you have no control. Crises began in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve disobeyed God. The whole program fell apart. Notice God did not panic because there's no crisis in the kingdom of God. God knows the end from the beginning, and so whatever happens, God is always aware it was going to happen, or he himself instigated it. And so the present global crisis that is causing great unsettling around the world, people losing their jobs, properties being repossessed, houses being foreclosed, companies shutting down, other companies going into bankruptcy, whatever you're experiencing, whether it's in the United States, or Africa, or Europe, South America, and the Caribbean, where I'm from, I am here to tell you that whatever you're facing, the good news is, to everything, there's only a season. And to every purpose, there's only a time. Mm -hmm. Notice that this crisis, therefore, has a shelf life. It cannot last. So the key to overcoming crisis is first of all to understand it is temporary. So the conditions that you're going through now, do not panic. You know, when you commit suicide physically, that is usually because you try to give a permanent solution to a temporary problem. Don't commit suicide. It isn't worth killing your life over something that will change. Whatever you're going through, maybe your house is being repossessed and you got to move back in with your parents. Hey, that's only temporary. And what I like about God is that every crisis that he brings you through, you always come up with a promotion. You know, when Daniel came out of the lion's den, he was promoted. When Esther came out of the king's presence, she became queen. Mm -hmm. When Joseph came out of prison, he became prime minister. I wonder what he got in store for you. Oh man, that's beautiful. Crisis is God's incubator for character development and promotion. So the key to overcoming crisis is to outlast them because they cannot remain forever. Outlast them. I love it. I'm getting wow. excited already. Oh, I love it. This oh, is glory, great. hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Your other book, The Principles and Benefits of Change, what is that about? Because we'll discuss that. You know, today. this book it took me 30 years to write this one, The Benefits of Change. Change is one thing that is permanent in life, and yet people are afraid of it. The only thing you can guarantee in life is change. There's nothing as permanent or sure as change. Change is actually inevitable. So if change is a constant, the key to life then is to learn how to manage and benefit from change. Change is beautiful. For example, I say this often that there can be no improvement without change. And yet not all change is improvement. For example, if you used to weigh 110 pounds and now you weigh 170, that was a change. But it's not an improvement. It can actually be a threat to your health. But if you want to improve, you have to change. And God is a God of change, even though God never changes. 
And only two things Say that in life. again, so that is powerful. Yes. One more time. God is a God of change. He is the God of change. But God never changes. Why is he a God of change? Because everything God does is always temporary. He never does the same thing twice. No miracle in the Bible was ever repeated. God never healed anyone the same way twice. God is too creative to remain a constant. God is permanent, but he never does anything the same way twice. So you got to get used to change. And change is the most beautiful thing in the world. Because change means that you are never going to be bored in life and you keep company with God. You know what is amazing? I heard this years ago. Yes. Every snowflake is different. Absolutely. Every, uh, you, your fingerprint is not the same as mine. Yes. God is the God of variety. Absolutely. Yes. And do you know that uh, we hate change because change threatens our security. And our security is what traps us. Nothing is more dangerous to self-destruction than comfort. Whoa, whoa. This is why, you know, Ecclesiastes 3 says this. It says, to everything there's a season. Then it says there's a time to be born and a time to die. There's a time to laugh and a time to mourn. We love the laughter part. But we forget that there's going to be a change where sometimes we got to cry. We love the part where it says we gather. But what about the part where it says we scatter? You know, change comes into your life to remind you that nothing is permanent. You gotta learn, therefore, to live life very loosely. Don't hold on to anything too tightly. That's why God has the principle of change in life. So comfort, go back to the danger of comfort. The danger of comfort and security is it traps you from development and growth. Whenever God wanted to do something great, he always upset comfort. Because the only way for God to take you where you're supposed to be is to get you to leave where you are. And where you are is secure. Change produces two things. It produces insecurity and the unknown. And both of them are very important for growth and development. But people are always afraid. I know. And we are afraid because we expect things to remain the same. Like I said earlier, the most important important approach to dealing with change is to expect it. We expect things to remain the same and so we set ourselves up for disappointment. The way you benefit from change is you expect it. I like what the Bible says in Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 3 verse, verse 4. It says there's a time to laugh and a time to mourn. When the morning time comes, I like the Bible says, uh, uh, we may mourn for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Now, why did you write this book? To help people what? I wrote this book because people keep destroying themselves, self-destruction, because they treat change as an enemy. When in fact, enemies, the enemy is comfort. The enemy is security. But God wants us to have security. Our only security is in God and he doesn't change. <laughs> See, Ezekiel says, verse 34 says, I will bless them on the place surrounding the hill. I will send down showers and seasons, and there will be showers of blessings. You know, we believe that we're supposed to be blessed all the time, all the time, every day. God says, no, I send down blessings and showers of seasons. There's a season that you may go through a difficult period, but that is to wake up your ability to change. Seasons of change provide some things. Let me give you what I wrote about in this book, very important. First of all, change means that nothing remains the same. Seasons means that everything is always temporary. Seasons also means that the key to life is outlasting a season. Change also means that seasons are an incentive for you to plan for the future. You know, nothing happens unless you change. So change is not our enemy, it's our friend. You know, I think about, I think about uh, every time God wanted to use someone, he would disturb their comfort. 
Abraham was brought up in a home with his father, his mother, his family. God says, okay, I want to do something great with you. Leave your parents and your home. That's discomforting. And then Abraham asks him, where are we going? God says, I'll tell you when you get there. That's the unknown. But look how great Abraham has become. I think with Moses, Moses was comfortable being a prince in Egypt. He had the access to all the wealth and power of Egypt. And here comes a change. God gave him a passion for delivering people. And that act of deliverance made him a fugitive. And that change took him to the desert, which gave him the privilege of meeting God by a burning bush. All these changes introduced him to being a coming a deliverer. You cannot become what you were born to be unless you are not willing to change into something you are not. This is why change is so important. Uh, I like what it says here. Uh, Shakespeare says, sweet are the uses of adversity. Does God use crisis That's to move you out of your comfort zone? That's the purpose for change. Yes. You know, we never grow in good times. We never advance unless we're under pressure. 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 Change comes to improve and to advance your life, not to destroy you. And so... I think now, right now the change is taking place in the world we don't understand. In this book I talk about the fact that God is changing the whole uh, scenario of the world. God is shifting the, the earth right now from west to east, from south to north. The church, for example, God is changing the church. The western church is shifting to the eastern church and the northern church is shifting to the southern church. May I ask why? Because the season has come. The greatest churches in the world are now going to be coming from South America and Africa. It's happening already. Absolutely. And in this book I talk about what do you do when change begins to happen to you? You know, what do you do? You can hate change, resist change, you can, you can become angry at change, but you cannot stop change. And what believe, are you supposed to do when change? You're supposed to understand change and adjust to change and then accommodate change and then manage it. You know, let me give you an important uh, point this in, this, is in this book. In this book. If, if you've always been in charge, but now it's time for you to be a partner, that becomes a difficult change. Some of the church leadership in the world, in the Western world, are now having to admit that they are no longer the leaders. The leaders are now emerging from South America. They're emerging from Africa. You know, there's a church in Nigeria, my friend, uh, Brother David Ayedipu, Bishop yeah. Ayedipu. His church building seats 52,000 people. That's a Sunday morning service, one service. In America, you have a church of 10,000, you think it's a great church. His church is Sunday morning, 52,000 members, and about 100,000 outside. God is shifting. So what do you do? When do you say, okay, unless you sing American songs, dress like Americans, or do American sermons, then you can't be accepted. No, God is shifting. And you've got to understand that what God is doing, he's doing it without your permission. Exactly. God doesn't consult anyone when he wants to change. He wants you to consult him. What happens in people's lives when change comes? What should they do? Repeat what you just said earlier. They should what now? You know, if winter comes, but you decide, I hate winter, and you put your swimming suit on, and you stand in the snow, and you defy winter, winter will kill you. Exactly. In other words, when change comes, you change your clothing. You adapt to it. Don't defy it. Don't fight it. Don't curse it. You learn and understand it, and then you accommodate that change and find your place in it. Every change that God does, you have a role in it, but you can resist it, and it can destroy you. I like what God says in the book of Isaiah. He says, Behold, I do a new thing. Will you not know it? Okay, now let me ask you something. How do you know the season has come for change? Because, you know, it's amazing. It's a very good question. I do an old chapter in the book on that. What to, how to recognize Seasons of change. And to know it's God. Of course. Yeah. Number one, when what you are doing is no longer effective, it's time to change. When the people around you 
begin to become an irritation instead of a blessing, it's time for change. When all your efforts seem to be causing more stress on you than causing blessings and fulfillment, it's time to change. In other words, when winter comes, everything cooperates with it. What I'm saying is very important. Very. When, when a season comes, everything cooperates with it. So when winter comes, the leaves fall, the bear goes into a cave, the trees lose all their leaves. You begin to see uh, different plants going into recession. They're preparing for the change. When a change is taking place, things that were against you suddenly become for you. People that said no before will now say yes. Change can be that dramatic. You know, tradition is the greatest enemy of change. And traditions are not bad. This is very important tradition. Repeat yes. that. This is so very important. You know, Pastor Benny, one day I was reading the Bible, and I read about a guy named Sam. You know Sam. Sam was a very powerful guy, muscular, strong guy. He was well we known Sam, okay. for his great feet. <laughs> we know him as Samson. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sam. Would be Samuel, Samson, Joshua, be Joshua. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> and I read the story about Samson. He was in the desert. He met a thousand Philistines. They came to kill him. Samson is standing there in the heat of the sun. The sand is hot. And he see a thousand men coming to kill him. They come with spears and daggers and swords and shields and horses. And Samson looks around. He's in trouble, and he sees a white bleached jawbone of a donkey. He reaches over, picks it up, shakes the sand out of it, and it has two teeth left in it. And Samson braces himself, and the thousand Philistines come. He begins to swing that jawbone. Men fall, horses spill over. He kept swinging. And after a few hours of swinging, 1,000 men lie dead on the sands of the desert. And Samson is standing there, breathing. <sighs> Blood all over his body, splattered all over his hands. And he has in his hands a jawbone, bleached white, soaked with red blood. And Samson just saw a miracle. He killed a thousand men with a jawbone of a donkey. That was impressive to me. But what blew my mind was, it says, one simple statement says, and when Samson had killed the Philistines, Samson threw away the jawbone. That changed my life. Mm. You see, we use things in life that worked. They were successful. If that was me and you, and we used that donkey's jawbone, we would have taken that, patented it. <laughs> That's exactly. We have taken it, registered to the Library of Congress. We have gone to a manufacturer, make a prototype. We have actually made a lot of these jawbones and called them Samsonite. Or something. Like we have made them a war weapon. Yep. And we would trade them to other armies and say, look, it works. I proved it. These can kill a thousand Philistines. And we would actually sell them as war weapons. Follow me carefully. We would then trade this jawbone, trade it as a weapon to the future armies. We would trade this jawbone. Why? It worked for us. Look at the word trade. Tradition. Oh, yeah. Tradition is taking a thing that worked for you and giving it to the next generation. That's what it is. Samson knew that even though that jawbone worked for him, the anointing left it and he threw it away. How true. Can you throw away success? Yes, because you could become so preoccupied by your own success, it can stop you from going to your next success. That's powerful. Tradition is frozen success. Oh, dear God, that's powerful. Tradition is when what your experience of God was, you believe it should be your children's experience also. Frozen success. That's tradition. Man. Traditions are not bad, but they can become useless if the anointing has left them. So you've got to learn to be willing to change. 
In this book, I talk about how to recognize... You know, some denominations need to hear this. Some churches and pastors need to hear this because you see some of them dead in an old move. You know, the crisis comes to destroy traditions. That's why crises are good. Everything that made the American economy work for the past 50 years has been confused. The church is the same way. Many churches are dying right now. Large churches are slowly dying because the things that they use for the last 20 years are no longer appropriate. And God is saying, look, the anointing has left the jawbone. Don't be angry. That is a powerful line. The anointing has left the jawbone. Absolutely. You know, the hardest thing in the world to do is to throw away something that worked. I'm going to preach a sermon on that. Yes, you got my permission. My God, that's powerful. Yes. So change comes to make tradition obsolete. This is why much of what you're doing stops working. It's not that it wasn't good or it wasn't su successful, but the anointing has left it. You know, I heard a man of God years ago say, when you have to push it, it needs to die. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. And Samson was smart enough to know that the anointing left the jaw bone. And he never tried to sell it to another generation. If you missed the beginning of this program, today, Pastor Benny Hinn is honoring the memory of his friend, Miles Monroe, who was recently promoted to heaven as the result of a tragic plane accident in the Bahamas. This interview has clearly demonstrated Dr. Monroe's wisdom and leadership ability, qualities which will be greatly missed, but will live on through programs like this and his many best-selling books. Two of these volumes are being offered to you today as a way for Miles Monroe's teachings to continue to change lives around the world, including yours. Let me talk about this one first, overcoming crisis. Yes. You, you ministered oh. on this yesterday. It was powerful. I want to send you this book for $30, and this is the only place you can get it right now. Yes. It will be in bookstores later. But right on this show is the first public release of both of these books. And by the way, Dr. Miles Monroe has donated a thousand of each yes. to our ministry, and that's all we have. So the first thousand, thousand when they go, it's gone. The next book, Benefit of Change, yes. you know what, I'm, I am going to read this one. Every pastor needs this book. Every businessman needs this book. Every investor needs this book on change. Because if we don't change our traditions, Keep in mind, tradition and truth are different. Truth never changes. Tradition is your experience with truth. God never did anything in the world twice. Also, this is a new book. Yes. That's not out in stores yet, but it will be. This is the only place you can get it now. Both books for $50. Get it today. Wow! <laughs> this is good. Brother, I love it. <laughs>